What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Rap and Wrestle podcast. Make sure you follow on Instagram, on Twitter, at Rap and Wrestle. Uh, today is a very, very special day. I st- that's how I'm starting off all my episodes. It's a very special day. Every day I get a new guest, it's a special day. But with this person right here, this person has uh, been very pivotal in helping myself, my partner Andrew with Wrestling IQ 101, um, Monster Mac, one half of one of the greatest tag teams of all time, the Hit Squad, uh, one of the greatest in-ring competitors. He won't say it or take credit for it. He has helped tons of guys. Monster Mac, welcome to Rap and Wrestle. It's good to have you here, man. What up, D-Rock? How you doing, man? You know I'm good, man. You know I'm always good. I'm always good when I'm talking to you. I'll, I'll, I'll put it like that. I always say one of the best things I love about talking to you and Andrew is that whenever we do any podcast, it's not like a podcast. It's like just two, three guys talking, shooting the breeze, and it's mad relaxed. So, you know, I don't expect anything less with this new venture you're doing. And, um, you know, I, I can't wait to talk about music and wrestling with you. Yeah, man. Yeah. I'll try to, you know, a lot of times I know uh, we talked on uh, Wrestling IQ 101, we, we briefly talk about the, the rap and, you know, we, we're more heavy on the wrestling. So mm-hmm. it's going to be good to, you know, kind of get your, your thoughts on both. And um, what, uh, since, you know, everything's been going on with, with quarantine and COVID and everything, just how have you been, like, adjusting it? And, like, what have you been up to for this whole time since the last time we talked? So, uh, you know, I got a regular job in a secret location, <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. Cap- uh, k Capital. But um, what you call I've been working uh, – pretty much the entire time I haven't had any days off um and uh I've actually lost not not through death or anything like that but I've lost like workers due to financial loss and um you know it's been it's been stressful but you know I've been doing my thing to make sure I keep my sanity especially now that wrestling is coming back slowly for me uh not really rushing into it uh this is my 23rd year in the business and you know my body definitely um not the young lion that it used to be but uh i still go out there um i recently had a great match with one of the young up and coming guys rick recon uh yeah. I had a match with uh the son of jp jk son of fat frank one of my boys someone who i've seen since he was like two years old and i got to share the ring with him and uh you know so like stuff like that is cool but honestly what i've been doing is uh learning how to uh, modify and, um, you know, modify arcades and video game systems and learning how to actually, uh, I've been taking classes on how to create my own video game. So I keep telling you guys, that's going to be, that's my goal is to create my own video game and, you know, one yeah. of the, do that. But uh, while I'm doing that, you know, just trying to get into as much music as possible and, you know, keep me relaxed and sane. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's weird because someone like me, I'm, I'm 41 years old, and the new generation of music, it's hard to listen to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I recently discovered, and it sucks because he's gone, Pop Smoke, who, yeah. I mean, he's dope. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, he's tough. I really enjoy his music. Uh, he's definitely got like a, a 2000s G-Unit vibe to him. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, so like just guys like that. Uh, my daughter, who's six, turning seven, she's very into music and i'm actually getting some influence from her and she put me on to tones and i uh with dance monkey and like i love that vibe you know what i mean my daughter she's like i said she's six she don't really know much about the world but she's got her own deal going on she's mad chill and like i can't wait till she's older and listen to music and just chill you know what i mean because that's something that from when i was a kid i loved doing you know and uh i'm sure we'll get into it in a second but you know i i just like that's what's basically what's been going on this summer. Listening to a lot of freestyle house um, from the '80s and '90s, uh, you know, TKA and K7, and you know, me and my boy Guapo, we we go back and forth about what songs to throw on, and you know, it, it's it's pretty awesome that I have friends that understand that vibe. So like yeah. for me, like the best part of the day is when I get to talk music like with my boy Guapo. And uh, we just BS and go back and forth. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's dope, man. See, I, I always liked that about you. I knew you were like uh, you're heavy into the hip hop, and I mean, you can even kind of see the um, the influence of hip hop on 
uh, you as a wrestler and even, you know, the hit squad as well. Uh, I felt like, you know, you guys were, you know, were, were heavy with the, with the hip-hop vibes when you guys were, you know, wrestling together. Um, you were talking about the, the video game. Um, what, um, what exactly do you want to do with the video game? Like, what, what type of theme or would, you, would you have it be? So um, it, it's crazy because this being the summer of Streets of Rage 4, uh, you know, all about a brawler. Uh, I would make a fighting game, but it's a little complicated. Um, you know, and, and, but with a brawler, you know, you, you assign a set amount of moves and, you know, it's not too crazy with the programming and with the animation and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, I just, to be honest, like, I know some of my boys are in video games, but, you know, not all of us are in video games. So I would like to have like just me and my crew, you know, yeah. the five, six of us, maybe a little bit more, you know, extended, maybe get some of my other friends, like you know, Pazuzu and stuff like that in the, in the game. But, you know, and even you and Andrew would be in the game. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, that'd be dope. <laughs> like, but, like, I just want to make it where it's the people that are in my world and um, just see what happens. Like, I have something set, and I talked to a couple of people about it, what I was thinking about, and they all are like, I can't wait to play this game. This game's going to be so fat. So, like, you know, I, I have a little bit of expectation uh, the only thing I told them was, listen, I'm not rushing. I'm taking it time. I'm taking my time um, because it's one of those things where, you know, I have so much other stuff going on. I can't just dedicate all of my time to it. If I could, I'd have it done within a year easy. But, uh, yeah. you know, hopefully within the next five to eight years, I'll have something, you know, maybe a mobile phone game or maybe just a ROM to just play on an emulator and, you know what I mean? Call it a day. But, yeah. like, I'm not make money off of it i'm just looking to create something for me you know yeah no, that, that'll be that'll be dope that'll um uh, right now I'm, i wouldn't consider myself a gamer but i'm like I, I play like a solid four games i'm like straight into like games out today old school stuff i'm all day street fighter mortal Kombat, mega mm -hmm. man mario brothers i'm down with all that stuff but it's like right to nowadays it's like you know i'm just playing with my son nba 2k wwe uh ufc stuff yeah. like that uh, okay. So you, you can help broaden my horizon on, <laughs> on some of these games. Uh, sure. Part of the reason why I'm into modding arcade games is because Arcade 1-Up brought out that line of smaller arcade cabinets. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, like they have Street Fighter. The one that I really want to get is the NBA Jam one uh, that just came out. I've just been uh, in between houses, so, like, I don't have, to, you know, the space to put it anywhere. Mm -hmm. But uh, once I do, it's what's up because – it's got Wi-Fi connectability, and you can play against whoever house, whoever else has it, and look for your boys. You know what I mean? So, you know, uh, I strongly suggest you picking one up and <laughs> yeah, yeah. go at it. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, that would definitely be dope. Now, you um, you you talked a little bit about um, uh, wrestling uh, opening back up, and you know, um, you've been doing some work with uh, Titan Championship Wrestling uh, mm -hmm. with Billy Feske. And uh, Charlie as well, both of those guys, two good guys that are friends of mine and, and Andrews as well. Mm -hmm. um, how has it been working there? And how I, I've, I haven't talked to a wrestler yet to get like their viewpoint on what they're, how it is the environment of working while, you know, all this craziness is going on with COVID. So it's a little, it's, it's almost normal up to a point for me. Um, I did the first, the first show I did, was uh, a couple of weeks ago, and then I did the back-to-back -back with the uh, girl show on Friday. I helped in the back, and then the Titan show on the Saturday. And, uh, you know, it, it's it's a little not – I mean, it's cool to see everybody, and that's the best part. You get to see all the people that you haven't seen in all these months whatever. And, like, you want to – first thing you want to do is just take off your mask and just be like, hey, what's up? You know what I mean? Yeah. But you got to restrain yourself, have self-control, and – you know, there's a couple of times you obviously are walking around and you just forget or, you know, whatever. So, like, that's the part that's weird is you have to constantly remind yourself, oh, I got to put my face mask on or I got to, you know, sanitize and stuff like that. But, um, you know, it was pretty normal uh, for me. Um, the weird part was really, like, during the week after, like, all right, I got to make it through this week and then I have another week and it's two weeks after the show and then I'm good, you know. So, like, I've done that every time I've worked so far. And it's like, 
oh man all right i made it. i made it. i'm up to friday of the second week i'm good i ain't got nothing you know what i mean so like yeah. and like like i said i've been working regular jobs so but there's no one in the building so i don't have to worry about it there's my three people in the office with me in the rest of the building where there's normally about 15 people there's maybe six and you know at least see anybody so you know i'm not too worried about it at work but when i go to wrestling i like after the show i'm like damn did i shake somebody's hand they looked a little suspect you know I mean? I mean, yeah. like wrestling fans always look suspect so yeah, it's nice. <laughs> even though it don't matter if it's wwe you know tna uh whatever aew or an indie show all wrestling fans look suspect to me so yeah. you know um, it, it's one of those things where you're like all right did i talk to anybody nearby where they could have coughed or any so like you you're thinking about that you're not even thinking about the stuff in the ring because the stuff in the ring for somebody like me just it's second nature but uh the new guidelines you know social distancing and all that stuff you worry about it and especially me having my daughter who's six you know and anybody that i live with or just come in contact with i'm always like all right i gotta make sure you know i don't do anything to risk their health you know um uh you know one thing i also um you know that I thought was uh, just like, you know, talking about bringing things full circle. Um, you know, when you fought uh, Jay Cage, son of uh, Fat Frank, uh, you know, Jersey All Pro Wrestling, um, just talk about like that moment and just like, you know, what what that signified to you. And, um, you know, I'm pretty sure it was a big moment for Jake. He's a, he's a young guy that I, I love and I think he's going to do really good in the business. And, you know, I'm wishing the best for him as well. But, you know, what what did that mean to you? Uh, it meant a lot, um, not just because I was wrestling my friend's son, um, but we were five minutes away from where he lived and where he passed away. And um, I know for Jake, it definitely was something. Um, you know, he grew up watching the Hit Squad, and he always had firsthand access to everybody. Um, like I said, he was two years old running around the locker room, and he, he wasn't a bad kid. Like, some kids – you know they're they're horrible kids <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> yep. his son you know but uh he wasn't a bad kid he was always playing he always you know just being a five-year-old kid six-year-old kid whatever he was at the time and you know um I'm like i just so much of him i see his dad in him and um it was it was hard to look at him and see certain faces that his father would make when we would talk. And you know, I was trying to make him laugh with memories of his dad and just telling silly stories that, you know, now that he's a, a, an older, you know, he's a, he's a man, I can get away with telling him some of the stuff that I couldn't tell him before because he was a kid, you know? Um, and if you knew Fat Frank, Fat Frank was definitely not for kids. <laughs> he was definitely, uh, you know, rated R, uh, but uh, he was so much fun and, and I really miss Frank. So in doing this match, um, I was very much with Frank in mind, you know, uh, the entire time. And it was very much, you know, when they say like you, your life flashes before your eyes, Jake's life flashed before my eyes, right before we locked up. And, and I saw the little kid turn into, you know, a high school student turn into, you know, a young adult and, it's really cool. And like you said, he does have potential and, uh, you know, he's moving, he moved down to Florida to Orlando and, uh, I know he's getting some quality training down there with a couple of guys that I know that I recommended. And, um, I'm really hopeful for him to be honest. I hope that, you know, he does a couple of things before he gets heavily into wrestling, but yeah. listen, you got the bug, there's no stopping him. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, you can plan all you want, but, you know, you, you just never know what's going to happen. And uh, I just hope the best for him. I definitely see a lot of potential in him. And, uh, you know, like I said, it was, it was a good feeling to share the ring with him. It was really cool. Yeah, definitely. Now, uh, you know, being uh, in New York, um, uh, you know, hip hop is big in New York. Uh, it's probably biggest in New York than it is anywhere in the world. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, so for, you know, something something I thought of that, I thought of the, you know, the, the hit squad, and I thought, who would Monster Mag think of as an equivalent rap group to the hit squad? 
Like who who do you think would, would symbolize you guys as a uh, as a as a rap group? Well, if we're talking about just me and Moff, um, I, I and I'm gonna catch all kinds of jokes, but uh, <laughs> uh, when we first started feuding with the Haas brothers, uh -huh. Charlie Haas and Russ Haas used to call us Fat Joe and Big Bun. Oh <laughs> man, <laughs> <laughs> we'd be in the middle of the match. Come on, big bud, what you got? You know, I love it. You know what I mean? Um, so I could definitely see Fat Joe and Big Pun being Mon Smack Mafia. Um, but if you're talking about the group, me, Moff, Key, Homicide, yeah. I mean, there's no way you could say anybody other than NWA. Um, okay, if you look it. at the diversity of the group, you know, um, it matches us to a T, you know. Um, but the the thing is, as you know, wrestling and hip hop started to uh, incorporate each other. You know, um, then a lot of people started saying they were NWA, and you know, kind of like, ah, but you weren't the Hit Squad. <laughs> you know, but like, yeah. you can't say nothing. You just everybody has their own opinions on things, and you just let it be. But um, more than anybody else, I think NWA represents us as a group. Um, like I said, diversity of the group, um, the different styles and different flows, you know, uh, you can compare us, you know, Moff is the facial guy. I'm the, you know, violent guy. Homicide is homicide. Loki is the professional. You know what I mean? Like there's different things that you can attach to us and it fits perfectly. Just like with Easy E, Easy E is the pimp rapper, you know what I mean? And, yeah. you know, Ice Cube is the thug rapper, and Dr. Dre is the, the brain thug, you know what I mean? And, you know, Yella is, he, well, I guess now he's a, a porn director, but you know yeah. what I'm saying? He's, uh, I guess he would be the freak. But, um, you know, um, NWA fits, and just the aggression when they were younger, and the, the attitude that they had, uh, that was us. And we all had a chip on our shoulder. We all worked for JP and we all felt like other companies should be giving us a chance and they never did. And, um, you know, it fit everything that we did. It was the, the same mindset. Plus, you know, and going back to Fat Frank, Fat Frank was one of the first guys that like white guys that I knew that would sing NWA and Easy E and Ice Cube. He knew all the words to everything. And, uh, you know, part of the things that me and Jake were talking about was how, uh, when Jake and his friends would go for a ride with Frank driving, Frank would start blasting NWA and he'd be like, oh, you love it. You know what I mean? It's just like, oh, but, you know, he, was, he, loved, he loved that music. So it always, it was fitting that he was our boss and he, we all loved the same stuff. You know what I mean? Uh, you would never, think it, but that was the way JP was. It was just diverse and, you know, it fit. It didn't fit one thing, it fit everything, you know? And that's kind of how we are, and that's how I see NWA. If you look at where everybody is now, they're all in different places in their lives, and it's really just a wide, eclectic mix of all kinds of stuff. Yeah, no, 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 definitely. And it's, it's crazy to think how um, just the influence that hip-hop has on just, like, American culture in, in general. You know, it might not get the, the respect it, it deserves, uh, but it influences everything from, you know, the black and Latino kids in the hood to, you know, white kids in the suburbs. Like everybody listens to it. Everybody relates to it, you know, somehow or some way for sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, like you said, I grew up in New York. I grew up in Bay Ridge, but at the same time, I had family all over and that I would stay with. So like my cousin, Noel, he lived in um, Coney Island and, uh, you know, I would stay with him every other week, give or take. And uh, he was, when I was about six or seven, I would say he's about 15, 16. And he was growing up when Run DMC was blowing up and when Slick Rick was blowing up. And, you know, um, Noel was, when I was coming up, he was the male definition of cool for me. You know, he had leather bomber jackets and the Adidas, you know, shell-toed Adidas with no laces and the Kango hats and, he was rocking all that the big fat gold chains and you know like when i see him i'd be like damn you know and like he had older brothers but they just 
they were too old. Uh, they were like in their twenties, whereas Noel was 15, 16. So like, I was like, Oh man, this, he's so cool. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, I'd try to hang out and pick his brain for certain things. And, you know, but as cool as he was, um, you know, my cousin Loki, his sister, Sessie, Sess, uh, she's the absolute epitome of cool in my world. Yeah. Um, growing up, she had the giant, like her room had all kinds of posters, but vividly I look up and I see in her room, she had the giant purple rain poster with him on the motorcycle. And um, everything she did was cool. And she ended up being a rapper and producer. And she had like growing up, you know, it wasn't uncommon to see most deaf hang out with her because most deaf and her and his brother Dante, they formed a group, a rap group in the early nineties, you know, oh, have a single out and like a video. And like, you know, I would see them and um, uh, she was best friends with Hurricane G who did songs with Diddy and she was married to Eric Sermon from EPMD. Oh, and man. I got to meet EPMD, uh, Red Man, um, Hurricane G, um, you know, a couple of the people, other people in the business through her. And, um, you know, it was, it was pretty dope. You know what I mean? Cause like, I was like maybe eight, nine, 10. I don't know who these people are at first, but then when she showed me, told me, I was like, damn, that's what's up. And like, I had a crush on Hurricane G for a hot second. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> yeah. Like then I, I thought about it. I was like, she's probably carrying a razor blade in her mouth and will be fast. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Nice. <laughs> Yeah, it's just kind of scary, but uh, it's funny because I talked to Homicide, and Homicide knew her from from back in the day, and he said the same thing. He was like, she was hot as hell, but she was scary, <laughs> you know, but, but then, like, I would go to, like, my grandfather's house. My grandfather lived not too far from Bed-Stuy, and my, my older cousins, uh, Max and Roger, again, with the Run DMC influence, you know, they had the Sherlin coats. And they had the thick frame glasses and, uh, you know, they were just, they were cool as hell to me. You know, I would see them and it would only be for like maybe five, 10 minutes that they were stopped by and then they had to go and like, I don't know. I just felt like they, they weren't drug dealers, but I was like, yeah. damn, they're living the life. That's what's up. You know what I mean? But, you know, it was all hip hop influence. So, you know, they were listening to, you know, uh, Melly Mel and Grandmaster Flash. And like I said, you know, Beastie Boys, they were awesome at the time. So, like, everybody was listening to Beastie Boys and, you know, uh, Run DMC and Slick Rick. Like, those are the names I think of as a kid coming up in New York that, like, you know, man, I grew up in a really – I was very fortunate to grow up where I did. You know, even though at times it seemed like it was rough because we didn't have money and stuff like that. But as long as I had a radio, you know, we were good, you know. Yeah. Um, it really – it helped influence a lot of stuff – later on in my life and my career wrestling um i mean you know if you don't say hit squad and it, like if if you if you say you're a hit squad fan you don't say that you think of snoop dog pump pump right away then you're not a fan of the hit squad you know yeah. there's people that i've never met before who are in the business and who are on tv and they're coming up to me saying pump pump you know what i mean and mm -hmm. like it's just something that i mean when i was coming up Samu and um and Maddie uh when they were in ECW um yeah ECW they were Samoan Island tribe they were using pom pom you know and there were a few gangsters and I always thought the song was badass like when I, when I was playing football you know that was one of the songs that used to get me hyped up that like I would smack people up with it you know what I mean <laughs> and so I was like well if it's working like that you know yeah. I'm on football I'm gonna do this in wrestling and um you know it, it just so happened that like you know, I didn't, I had no idea about the Samoan West Coast culture until like Booyah Tribe came out and you got to see them rocking, you know, the, the wet braids and, you know, just rocking the West Coast style. And it was like, damn, son, I thought Samoans were only, you know, these head shrinking looking dudes in WWE. I had no idea they were gangster. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It opened up a lot of stuff too, as far as music, because, you know, you weren't seeing all kinds of stuff like that. You only saw, you know, whatever, like it. You didn't know that people in Iran was getting down to Biggie. You thought they all looked like the Iron Sheik and they were rocking camels on their gear. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah, that's, that's yeah. when I grew up, but then as the world opened up, you got to see, it was like, damn, hip hop is huge. Yeah, definitely. Japan, let me tell you, going to Japan, they sang better, you know, better than me, like, you know, with less of an accent than anything. 
And we were just like, we were like, yeah, this was up, son, you know? Mm -hmm. The boy culture is huge there and like all this awesome stuff in Japan and it's still huge now. And like, but you see that it's taken on now, it's taken on its own flow and flavor. And it's like, damn, man, I wish I could have been there more for that to witness that live, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, definitely. So if if you were uh, composing your own uh, playlist, we'll call it the Monster Mac playlist, uh, what would be artists that you would definitely have to have on that playlist? So with hip hop, Cypress Hill, definitely. Old mm -hmm. Cypress Hill, um, Ice Cube, Biggie, Pac, you know, the, the basics of hip hop. Um, I love Eminem. Uh, you know, my, my, my girl Liza and I, uh, when we first met 20 years ago, we bonded over the second Eminem album, you know, Marshall Mathers yeah. album. Yeah, and, you know, it, it just, it was something that was like, damn, this is what's up. You know what I mean? Eminem is awesome. Uh, at the same time, like, I don't listen to a lot of it, but I'm, I've been cool with them. We shared locker rooms. We had awesome talks, but I'm cool with ICP, you know, St. Cloud Posse is a bunch of cool ass dudes. And, you know, like I said, we, we shared locker rooms. We talked and uh, it was, you know, when Ring of Honor first started and, you know, back in the early 2000s, you know, but at the same time, I got to know them a little better, you know, and they have their artist Tech Nine, and some of his jams are, you know, pretty awesome, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm more of a, you know, a more laid back kind of dude, so I like stuff that's got a good flow, more of like, today was a good day for Ice Cube, um, you know, I, I do like to get hyped up when I need to for like wrestling, so I'll go to like something more hard, like an NWA and, you know, uh, I'd rather be with you uh, is something that I always love hearing before a show. And uh, even Meek Mill, I like listening to Meek Mill, Dreams and Nightmares before a show. That was like, that was the ritual that me and Moff had before every Beyond show when we were teaming up for that run. We'd show up to the building, sit in the car for an extra six minutes and listen to Meek Mill's Dreams and Nightmares, you know. Um, but at the same time, like, I could listen to Sugar Hill Gang and I could listen to Nas. I love Nas. When we used to wrestle uh, LAX, uh, Proud and Powerful, Ortiz Santana, mm -hmm. it came out to Nas, um, New York State of Mind. Yeah. And I always come out first when I knew we were going to wrestle them because that song gets me hyped. Like, mm -hmm. just to see the whole crowd bob their head to the beat and then just that opening verse and, like, just listen to Nas spit and it's like, damn, son, this is dope. I can't wait. Let's go party you know what i mean yeah, yeah. Like, you just feel it like it brings it out i mean you can see now how my mood changed just thinking about it because like mm -hmm. i sit and i think and i'm like damn i miss you know going to war with them but at the same time i miss listening to their music and just dan 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 you know what i mean like mm -hmm. it, it was awesome but then like when i listen to homicide and he comes out to the truth with the kill bill opening yeah. and I was there when our boys Scott and Dom mixed it for them. And, um, you know, like, it, it just, it felt natural. You know, it was so dope. Uh, we all love Kill Bill. We went to go see it in the movies together. And then the truth was something that always just, it felt raw. And it felt like it was from the projects. And, like, it felt gritty and grimy. You know what I mean? Like, you felt everything he said. And to this day, you still feel that. And, like, when he would come out to it, and especially Ring of Honor, once they started using those metal uh, gates for the guardrails, and the mm -hmm. fans would bang to the to the beat, you know, uh, when Homicide won the the title, the, as he's making his entrance, like I had to sit out in the crowd, wait for my spot, whatever. But I'm listening to that, and I'm getting so hyped up. I'm like, yeah, let's go. You know what I mean? I was ready. Like you could have shot me, I would have just kept going, you know, because I was just feeling it. Um, so like you know, there, there's it's my range is very wide when it comes to hip hop, actually just music in general. Um, sure. But, you know, I also consider like some house and freestyle hip hop, because if you look at how it formed in the early eighties and melted into the late nineties or late eighties with mm -hmm. hip hop, like I said, case heaven, you know, he started out with TKA TKA was pure house freestyle, you know, uh, Cynthia and Johnny O type music. And then, you know come baby come hits and it's like this is hip-hop you know what i mean yeah, yeah. um so you know I, i'll listen to you know a shannon or a stevie b or little Susie, and to me it's that's hip-hop too you know so it really is 
a wide range of stuff that you know you can consider hip hop. But when it comes to that, I think of like I said, the influence that my my cousin Sess had. My mom had a lot of musical influence on me too. So like, mm-hmm. what she would, my mom and my older sister, um, they would um, listen to stuff like cleaning house on a Saturday. So like I'd hear you know um, everything from Culture Club to you know um bon jovi to what you know whatever was hot during the day and um but my mom always stuck with you know freestyle and house and she likes some of the she likes stuff like craft work which you know if you know anything about music you know that yeah. africa bambata sampled mm-hmm. the stuff you know yeah. for that for that early stuff you know and it always came out dope you know but then like she liked herbie hancock too and herbie you know, he, his beats were b-boy music. So, like, you know, you always got the bomb, bomb, bomb. You know what I mean? You felt mm-hmm. it. So, like, it, it was – it's all over the place for me, <laughs> basically. Yeah, no, no, that's good. That's good. A lot, a lot of diversity. I like that for sure. Um, something I always think about, too, that's, that's big that that I feel like it happens a lot in New York. Um, are you into uh, battle rap? You listen to any of that? Watch any, any of those? So – um I've watched, I was actually at a couple of uh, just local competitions. Mm-hmm. And uh, and the only reason why I did it was because as I started getting into wrestling and, uh, you know, my promos, like I always had decent promos, but like it wasn't aggressive where like, you know, you just say the generic things, mm-hmm. you sound, you're angry because you're yelling. But you know, and then you pick up, you're like, oh, all right, there's going to be this. So we would check. I checked out maybe about five altogether, you know, different competitions. And you just feel the flow and you see how they're reading the crowd and you yeah. how they're listening to the music and they're, you can see them, but while they're getting this, they're preparing, you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. they're feeding whatever off of each other. And a good promo in wrestling is two people feeding off each other. You know, I, I've always felt that. Um, you know, like when Jay Lethal and Ric Flair just freestyled it, and it, they didn't really even talk English. Yeah, they just yeah. like hugs, but it was like the best nonsense. You know, yeah. I mean? so yeah. like, you know it, it. It's stuff like that. You know that it helps. I think if more people did stuff like that, you know, checked out, you know, freestyle battles, or go to like a real life, you know, stand up comedy you understand to read the crowd better, you know, and with freestyle, you know, competition, battle rap, you have to understand what the crowd is into, you know, you could sit there and say, I'm gonna cut your mother up and call her a slut because I'm the big schmuck, you know what I mean? Like, you can say something, they don't want to hear gore, they want to hear something clever, you know, and you, that's where you pull out your common and you pull out your guru, you know what I mean? And you got to feed that, um, but then there are some that just want to hear you, you know, get as crazy as you can with the diss. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh, hard. Your mother's organs are gonna collapse. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. Some crazy I mean? stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you have to learn to read the crowd, and you have to also understand, you know, what's the mind frame of the guy that is throwing disses at you. You know, if if you don't understand where he's coming from, same thing with wrestling. If you don't understand where he's coming from, you're never gonna pick up, and it's never gonna flow good. You know, if you understand where he's coming from, what his mind frame is, it makes it a lot easier to have a great flow, you know. Um, but I, I, I used to, I remember in high school, we used to watch uh, tapes of uh, Battle Rap. And, um, you know, it was, I mean, dude, it's like, it's like a sporting event. <laughs> I mean? Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. It is, I, you know, I think it, it doesn't get, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of light shined on it like it should. I think it's, it's amazing. I'm a big fan of like the uh, you know Ultimate Rap League URL, mm-hmm. Smack, and um, a lot of you know. There's a lot of other guys that have tried to um, come out with their things as well. Um, but like I said, I think it relates to wrestling like like so well. It's the same thing. It's, it's controlling the crowd, and a lot of times it's, it's performance. It's like you know you it's believability on some part. But at the same time, it's like, you know, do you really think these guys are just going to go shoot up everything? It's like, no, but it's like, just enjoy it, you know? Yeah. But I'll I'll say the the one thing about this, about battle rap, I always found like weird was the the guys who do battle rap, yo, they can do like the best disses in the world. 
and but then a lot of them they fell at like making good songs on to succeed in that i always thought that was weird that combination of that yeah but see i think that's why so many people like eminem because eminem could do both he could battle and he can entertain you know um it's it's very fine line of you know being an entertainer and being you know a battle rapper uh in the same way that it's a fine line of being an indie wrestler superstar and a tv wrestler superstar you know Uh, there's limits to both and you really it's hard to mix and be good at both of them you know um i mean look at how many guys go to leave the wwe or any tv wrestling they try to work on the indies and it's not as good you know because they're a certain style but then you watch guys that should be awesome on tv that are great in the indies and they have great careers you know it just it's one of those things that you know you could be good at one you can't be both it's hard to be good at both you know and the same thing happens for battle rap but it's funny i was just gonna say uh there's a guy that i like watching on youtube his name is gully boy i don't know if you ever seen him gully boy yeah 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 yep so he just put out a video not too long ago about the craziest battle rap video that he ever had. That uh-huh. he ever seen. And uh, dude, it, it's awesome with his commentary. But then you listen to him, you're like, "Damn, some of these guys really suck, though." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how it's not made for everybody, man. It's not me. It's definitely uh, not made for for everybody for sure. Um, you know, when I was thinking about that, I, I was, I was kind of getting those vibes um, um, yesterday. I know something that that you enjoyed, I know a lot of people uh, didn't enjoy, was uh, Raw Underground. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? What do, you, what do you think they're doing? I was confused, to be honest. I don't, I don't have an opinion on it yet. Uh, what, how how'd you feel about that? I loved it. I thought it was great. Like I, the, the thing that kills me is wrestling fans. Yeah. Yes, we all know they got this from, and, and listen, there was stuff before this But we all know that William Regal was pictured last year and the year before and the year before that at Mm -hmm. Bloodsport, whether Mm -hmm. it was Matt Riddle's or Josh Barnett's, they were there. They've been watching. They know what's up. Listen, they have people that watch the Indies. So, you know, it's, I know for a fact, you know what I mean? I've talked to people about it. Uh, People that have left that they've told me, you know, they know all about you and like, no way. Yeah, no, they watch all your DVDs, whatever the hell you put out, you know, um yes it was definitely blood sport however there was other people who did it before blood sport there's people who did it before them and this is where the wrestling fans kill me oh they just bit off of that and they didn't even do it good and (laughs) that's the part that killed me not the actual thing i like i think it should be its own half hour 45 minute weekly thing Uh away from raw in that the, the way that it got over Dolph Ziggler, right? All these mm-hmm. years, Ziggler's been the consummate WWE pro wrestler, right? Mm-hmm. This showed his, his – his, he has an amateur background. He was yeah. in Kent State, played out. He fought amateur wrestling, was mm-hmm. awesome. And if I'm not mistaken, I think he won a championship or something along those lines. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But you've never seen that up until yesterday. You know, um, they introduced that new big guy. Seven foot tall. He looked like a monster, right? The last few months since WrestleMania, the the War Machine, because I, I never know what their WWE name is. Viking, yeah, yeah, yeah. Viking never, Raiders. Viking yeah. Raiders. I like calling them War Machine because that's how I know them. Yeah. In one segment, they went from being clowns to being legitimate, and you believe them. But yeah. then ultimate icing on the cake was MVP and his guy coming out. And the first one was Bobby Lashley. Bobby Lashley, who's been in WWE now for, what, two years? Mm-hmm. He hasn't looked at dominating in the entire time. It's before he left the WWE originally. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, he looked like a monster. But then Shelton Benjamin takes off his shirt. Shelton Benjamin went into Kurt Angle rage mode. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. yeah, everything just pow, 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 and then raped that kid. You know, dude, the 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 doctor bomb that Bobby Lashley hit out of nowhere. I said it. I was like, he didn't tell that kid he was doing that. He just grabbed him and did it. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it yeah. was and then MVP got to show what what I'm getting to is with pro wrestling, all these guys, and listen, wrestling's inclusive, wrestling's for everyone. Mm-hmm. But for years, for decades, 
it was built on the fact that when you saw someone in the ring, you believed that they could whip anybody's ass in the building. It didn't matter who it was. They could beat up everybody. And that was what built it. And that's what made money for decades. You know what I mean? The entertainment part is cool. Don't get me wrong. But every once in a while, you need to show these people the animal that they are. You need to remind them. Oh, yeah, no, they can definitely pick up a 225-pound guy with one hand. You know what I mean? And slam him on his neck and look nasty and be vicious. And what I like ultimately, obviously, they're going to bring it back for another week, maybe, you know, a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. But it looks like they're setting up the possibility of Brock Lesnar versus Bobby Lashley. And yeah. what I like about that, again, Brock Lesnar has been this undestructible beast for the last five years or whatever, how many years it's been since he came back. Unstoppable. Mm-hmm. Who's really dominated Brock Lesnar? Nobody. Goldberg, that's it. You know what I mean? But, like, this makes Bobby Lashley look like not only can he destroy Brock Lesnar, he could rip his body piece by piece, limb from limb, and it looks legitimate. He needs that. If you're going to build, if you want me to watch that, don't just put it on WrestleMania. Build up Bobby Lashley in this. He's been looking awesome with MVP. You know, they were doing this whole thing with Rusev and Lana, and it's a shame because I think Rusev would have fit right in with those guys. That's yeah. a murder. If you look at those th- those three guys and you throw in Rusev, that's a murder squad, you know? Yeah, for sure. And this legitimizes them in the most utmost way. What kills me is because there's so many geeks who watch wrestling now, and I, I mean that in the most loving way. I'm talking yeah. about kids that didn't play sports, that never, you know, <laughs> felt a foul in their life, you know? Yeah, yeah. They're all like, oh, that's not believable. Really? Because last time I checked, Bobby Lashley is legit an amateur wrestler. Shelton Benjamin used to throw around Brock Lesnar. Legit amateur wrestler. You know what I mean? MVP, who, one of my boys. MVP is a jujitsu judo master. Mm-hmm. Belts, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It, everybody that did something last night had something legitimate to say. And I, you know, I don't have faith in WWE in that they're going to be able to continue to make it look great. I do yeah. like the production. They could have gotten rid of the stripper girls, but at the same time, for someone like me, it fit because yeah. of men's club. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you look at how it was set up, it's supposed to be in the back room, mm-hmm. you understand, know where not everybody has access to it. But see, because everybody wants to be included in everything, they're going to complain, oh, the girls, blah, blah, blah. But listen, five years ago, well, you were, how old are you, D? I'm 33. All right. So five years ago, you were 28. You mm-hmm. tell me you wouldn't have been down going to that building, looking at the girls dance and people beat the crap out of each other? Yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> Red hot, young blooded males. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but yeah. It's going to be, you could already see people already like, Take the girls out, and maybe I'll believe it. But oh man, if you look at it, you know. Then the other thing that made me laugh was, if you look at the setup, everybody's saying, "Oh, they took it from Bloodsport, and Bloodsport took it from Chikara, and Chikara took it from whoever else, whatever." WWE made a movie about it called No Holds Barred. Yeah, no, yep. Barred is the same setup. Same thing, right? <laughs> yep, yep. What's the difference? But I loved oh. it. Great, and I really do hope something comes out of it like i said i really if they do it just to build up you know guys who have legitimate backgrounds and to build up the brock lesnar uh bobby lashley thing i would definitely be into it hopefully matt riddle shows up soon uh yes. drew, drew gulak maybe uh daniel bryan i mean mm-hmm. dude riddle and daniel bryan getting involved you know and yes. the best part, you can hear joe salivating samoa joe salivating <laughs> on commentary he's like oh man i need to go there you know what i mean because that's that's perfect for Joe. Joe, yeah. MC, or as a fighter, would be awesome in that situation. Shane's great, but Shane can only do it once or twice. Get him Shane. out, put Joe in. You put Joe in, I guarantee you. You let Joe have some creative say. You let the guys have creative say on how they want to present it. I guarantee you it's a home run. And as long as it's a WWE-controlled thing, though, they stumbled onto something, and then once they see it's on their shoe, they're going to wipe it off. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, true, true, true. Yeah, I learned – I learned, you know, with some of those things uh, that you you just give WWE um, a chance and see what they could do with it. That that was the same thing with um, 
I think people made that same mistake with like Bray Wyatt when he was doing the weird stuff and people were like, what the hell is this? And then it turns into like one of the best things into WWE. It's just like, you just, you just got to wait sometimes with the, with those guys. Um, I will say with the, um, with uh, MVP Lashley and Shelton though, um, I, I always loved MVP and um, they give me those vibes from uh, when they had the, the beat down clan and impact wrestling. And I, I wish that could have went longer. It was MVP Joe homicide. Like uh, and, uh, okay. Kenny too as well. And I was Kenny. like, yo, those dudes. I was like, that that was a great group. And nice. I think this is something that can be similar to what that was. All those guys were amazing. I think all these guys, they're amazing too. Maybe add one more person and you know see where it goes. I think if they did some um, back like behind the scenes of them either like training or list, chill and vibe and listen to music. Kind of like how they do those promos with uh, uh, an impact with uh, Desmond and Zach, where it's yeah. like that 70s show just chilling, you know, in mm-hmm. the smoke. Whatever. Uh, if they gave them some promos like that, where it showed them in their environment, chilling, listen to music, you know, the good thing is they're letting them, they're being very relaxed with them and the whole group. You know, you saw the one dude was, you know, uh, Shelton was wearing the, um, the, the Shad Gaspar shirt, you know what I mean? And like, yeah. They're letting them do things out of the box, which I like. Um, and I, I'm really sure that I'm pretty sure that's MVP's influence. Um, yeah. When I was in Brooklyn backstage, you can see MVP, you know, he's, um, he's a master of his craft, and, but he definitely knows how to work the room. And, um, you know, I, I hope that he gets a chance to be a lot more creative with certain things and with certain people, because I think that, you know, if, if they do, opens up a lot of things because let's listen man we're talking about hip-hop mvp mm-hmm. it's wwe hip-hop i yeah, mean he sure. songs on itunes I, I bought a couple of them you know um mm-hmm. i listened to one or two of them you know what i mean um but like he is hip-hop and he's like i said before he's the definition of cool in the wwe right now you know and um i think if they brought in uh maybe a naomi you know yeah. uh if they brought her in I think, man, how badass would that group be? You know, she's a little and nobody could touch her. They keep holding her back for whatever reason. But if you let her open up, um, put her, you know, foot to the pedal, she'll destroy everybody. Don't matter for who it is. You know, she's been doing stuff for a long time, but for whatever reason, they're holding her back. But I think in a group like this, in a situation in a setting like that, with MVP, Lashley, Shelton, Listen, steel sharpened steel, and they would definitely make her a better performer, better athlete, better wrestler, better entertainer. And um, I think people would see it and enjoy watching her be in a group like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, definitely. I think that that would definitely be uh, good for her. Now, I know a lot of the fans have been voicing their uh, disapproval with, you know, the way Naomi has been being booked. Uh, so that that could be something that could help her out for sure. That'd be that'd be good for. Her. Um, I, I really don't I don't pop for a lot of people's entrances, but uh-huh. when she feel the glow, like that's that's, that's freaking awesome. You know what I mean? Like yeah, it's dope. That up is dope, and like I said, she's such an amazing wrestler. She's by far listen. Charlotte is the golden child, mm-hmm. but if they were to go by pure talent and ability. Naomi outshines everybody by far. She outshines most of the guys. Yeah. You know what I mean? And like, I've talked to Homicide. I've talked to Key. They've trained with her. You know, when she first started, they all know how incredibly talented she is, and uh, she needs to be given, you know, some spotlight because I think it would be a shame if they were to like to release her and she either walks away from wrestling or she doesn't have the shine because she's in her prime right now. You know, mm-hmm. and the talent in WWE is amazing, you know, for women. So she should be. Why aren't we seeing her with Asuka? Why aren't we seeing her with Charlotte, Becky, Bailey? You know, even bring up some of the other ones, like the Iconics, you know, bring yeah. them up, you know. But for whatever reason, they're not. And, you know, but the good thing is, like you said, the fans are starting to recognize that she's being held back. And it's kind of like, huh? Why? You know, she's got the entrance, she's got the charisma, the promos. You know, when she won in Orlando, that was one of the biggest pops of that WrestleMania. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, for sure. It was pretty dope. You know what I mean? And they definitely need to capitalize more on her. Yeah, well, we'll see. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, 
how how does it feel when you know you see guys like uh like Warhorse getting you know opportunities to be on you know AEW and challenge Cody for a title um you know guys that you, in, that you booked in uh Jersey All Pro uh Matt Riddle Keith Lee you know I don't remember those guys here in Jersey you putting them on a card and we're just like yo this is a dope match and then next thing you know these guys are signed to WWE. Like, mm-hmm. like, how does how does that feel to you? Do you get like a, a sense of enjoyment when you see things like that? Definitely, I always get a sense of pride in knowing that there's certain guys that I've helped. Um, you know, as I'm getting older, I still love wrestling. Don't get me wrong, but mm-hmm. my desire to be a part of the ring is, you know, dying. Um, mm-hmm. Not for any negative reason. It's just, you know, I have other interests. Like I was saying before, with video games and music i mean it doesn't get any more you know video game music i uh, modded a playstation classic and the first mm-hmm. game i had it was mtv music generator so oh, i could man. you know what i mean like yeah. like that's something that i've always been down with you know what i mean um but it's still cool to me that the guys that i chose to help bring up santana ortiz look are they is there anybody who's as popular of a tag team as them right now in AEW. It's hard to say, you know what I mean? They're one of the top, even private party, private party, you know, Mm -hmm. me and Moff got our hands on them. And then I kept trying to help them do other stuff. You know what I mean? Like House of Glory did their thing with them. Now they're one of the top tag teams in AEW. It's awesome to see Eddie Kingston. Eddie Kingston's someone that back to the Bayonne days, you know, um, I knew that, you know, I knew of him. Um, and then as, you know, time went on, I got to know him better. He was he was at my wedding. You know what I mean? He was one of the few guys in the biz that was at my wedding. He's family, you know. Um, and I'm very proud to see not only did he perform great, but then he got signed off of it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I really wanted to see him in the NWA, uh, you know, challenge for the NWA title because uh, I think Nick Aldis is – an amazing athlete and I think that been phenomenal you know what I mean but I'm glad that they gave him the mic because if they don't give him the mic then you're taking it's like taking the mouth off a of Deadpool you know what I'm saying mm-hmm. yeah, Eddie, yep. talk man if Eddie Kingston talks he's gonna get a butt every 18 inches you know and um and I'm glad that they recognize his talent and then War Horses I, I said it the other day he's somebody that I mean, he was, I think he was like 18, 17, maybe around that age. Um, you know, I saw him at uh, Joel Maximo's Lutus. Mm-hmm. And he was with the Vikings. And, dude, they were, they were just, everything about them was just this massive amount of energy. And I loved it. And he was a smaller one, so he was a lot more bumps. But he was also doing a lot of cool stuff. Yeah. So as soon as I could get him in, I wanted the Vikings in more. I brought him and the Vikings. And then as soon as I could get him in, I brought him in. And he, they were getting bookings all over the East Coast because of the stuff they did at JAP. You know, mm-hmm. like, like you said, Keith Lee. Keith Lee, I won't take, you know, credit for Keith Lee. That was beyond. they the ones that took the chance to put him with Dijak. And now yeah. you get to see him and Dijak go nuts. You know, Riddle's the same thing. Riddle, I met him at Beyond. He's mad cool. Listen, man, if there's anybody you want to get on this podcast to talk about music, <laughs> it's Matt Riddle, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, but we bonded, and, you know, he was down to work for JP because I was going to put him with Loki, you know what I mean? And we were going to build that up, and it just didn't work out that way. But, you know, it, 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 it is cool to see. Even Bandito Jr. Bandito Jr. has been someone I've known since he's like, 12. And now he's one of the top referees for the WWE, you know? Um, Matt, um, I'm sorry, Sean Bennett. You know, um, mm-hmm. Sean Bennett is a pure JP guy. You know, he started out at Kevin Knights, but he was JP official. And, like, he's had a job now for, what, like almost 10 years, something like that, give or take. You know, yeah. and it's, it's cool as hell to see all these dudes that, you know, we, we all grew up together and we all work together and they're all doing things. And, you know, even Kenny Omega. Dude, Kenny Omega was a JP guy way before. And that's Danny DeMond. I can't take part, you know props on that but that's Danny DeMonto but you know then I see guys like Nick Gage blowing up and I see guys like Schlack they're not TV level but as good as TV as you could get you know what I mean 
Mm-hmm. And like, it's cool because I had a little bit of a hand. Kyle the Beast, man, I'm dying. I don't understand why Kyle the Beast ain't making millions right now. Seriously. You, know, you guys have been seeing it. You know what I mean? So like, I, I just, it, it, it frustrates me that some guys don't get, but I am happy to see a lot of the guys that, you know, I've helped get somewhere and do something and be the top, you know, and it, it listen, man, ultimately, you know, all I ever wanted was for the young, the younger guys in the business coming up under me mm-hmm. to leave it in their hands and feel secure that they were going to take the business to new heights and make it better. And a lot of those guys through with that, you know, and um, it, it is cool. It's like, it's like a father seeing the kids, you know, grow up, get a job, get married, live an awesome life and know that it's your hands that help mold that clay, you know? Um, and, it, and listen, I can't take all the credit by myself. That's, that's just wrong. But I know that I helped a lot and I know that I helped them get to that next level. And then once they got to that next level, they did it, you know, but it is cool for me to see that, you know, yeah, even yeah. You, got, you and Andrew, man, you guys, everybody wants to talk to you guys. You know, <laughs> like, remember in the beginning, you guys are all scared, timid, you know, especially yeah, yeah. afraid to approach anybody, you know, but now I, when I look at what, you know, whenever wrestling IQ comes up, I see all these top names in the business and I'm like, damn, when the hell did that happen? You know what I mean? Yeah, it's crazy, man. I, it's crazy. That and I didn't even know. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, man. It's crazy to think, <laughs> to think who we've gotten on, you know, uh, how far we've gotten. Uh, but hey man you know we just keep we keep grinding and you know keep trying to you know do it um you know something something that's also interesting kind of like uh you know for warhorse and for even eddie kingston you know they uh got their shot at the tnt championship being on AEW. um i love what they're doing how they're uh bringing in those those independent guys mm-hmm. um I know you said, yeah, you know, your time in the ring is kind of, you know, it's kind of dwindling in a way where, you know, you don't want to do it as much. But um, is is that something that you think of when you see AEW doing things like that? You're like, hey, I could that could be me. Because, I mean, I think on the indie scene, you're a guy that a lot of people respect and would put their, you know, back behind Monster Mac to see Monster Mac fighting Cody. Like, I, I would enjoy to see that, man. I appreciate that. Um, it means a lot coming from you. Um Honestly, you know, when I'm a very honest person, I'm a very, uh, tell you straightforward to your face Mm -hmm. about things. Uh, And and to be honest, as I get older, I'm even more so like that. I just don't, I don't care to sugarcoat things. Um, If I was in my 20s, um, instead of wasting my potential the way that I did for a large part of my career, I would have focused, you know, trying to get to an AEW to wrestle Cody. Um, instead, you know, I let a lot of things get in the way of me reaching the success that I should have reached, that my potential dictated that I should have reached. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying feel sorry for me. I'm not saying, you know, uh, here's a sob story, blah, blah, blah. None of that. Because we're all men and women in charge of what we do. Um, I tell a lot of people that, you know, don't be like me. Don't waste the opportunity. You know, reach out and grab if it's there. If it's not there, get yourself in a better position to get there, you know, to be able to reach out. And before November of 2019, I was like, no, nah, that's not for me. Yeah. But then once I got to be backstage at WWE for the first time and witness and see, and then the second show I was at, mad love from all the NXT guys that I helped get to, you know, not just Keith Lee and, you know, uh, Dijak, but you had Strickland, Shane Strickland, um, Roddy, um, Roderick Strong, Adam Cole. Like there was a lot of dudes who were coming up. Oh, Steve, what's up? It's good to see you. And like, it was awesome. And then I get to go Brooklyn and I get props from, you know, um, the good brothers, uh, I get props from, of all people, Ray Mysterio, that he recognized me from when I was in Boston. And in Boston, he recognized me from JAP, you know? And he was like, oh, big man, what's up? It's good to see you. I haven't seen you since I wrestled low key. I was like, huh? You know what I mean? <laughs> and, like, it made me feel like 
I should have been there this whole time, you know, if not wrestling, at least backstage doing something. And the older that I'm getting, I'm more about the backstage experience. You know, um, wrestling is dope. Listen, no one ever get me wrong. If I could wrestle in front of 20,000 people every night for years, I would. And I would take bullets to the face doing it and keep going. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I, I, as I'm getting older, you know, I'm more realistic about things. I know that I wouldn't be able to, without a few months, like Rocky style training, <laughs> I wouldn't yeah. be able to jump in there and give, you know, a great, I could give a good TV match, but I wouldn't give a great TV match. I wouldn't be satisfied with it. Um, mm-hmm. Cody, someone though, that, um, I told him the story and he thanked me like the whole night. Um, when I was in ring of honor in 2003, somewhere around there, it was one of the first Rex Black shows and in the locker room, Dusty Rhodes was there and I was talking to Dusty, just, you know, just talking, picking his brain. All of a sudden Rick Steamboat comes by. And uh, Ricky Steamboat, you know, him and Dusty are talking, and they involved me in their conversation. Now, to me, I mean, look, I'm 41 years old, 23 years in business. To me, I'm still a nobody. Mm -hmm. They include me, two huge legends of the 70s, 80s, 90s. They include me in their conversation. So to me, I'm just like, the whole room is looking at me. And they're like, how the hell is Steve talking to them? You know what I mean? You can feel it, you know? But they were talking about their sons. And for someone who I've always felt that even though my dad is alive and I know my dad and whatever, he's never been a part of my life. Mm -hmm. So to listen to two fathers talk about their sons, I mean, I was thirsting that, you know, like I was like, damn son, that's what it's like. And they were talking about their sons and their sons were going, I think they were in the same town or they were in the same, you know, district or whatever it was. Uh, And they were, you know, talking about their wrestling accolades and stuff. And I told Dusty, I mean, I told Cody about what Dusty had said about him and how he was beaming and so proud of his son. And I said, you know, it's something that every son, you know, even if he never told you, you should know that that's how he felt. And he always thanked me. And like, I always felt like if I were to ever cut a promo on, on Cody, that's what I would use. You know what I mean? Like that. Um, And he was, he started tearing up because it was right after Dusty had passed, like maybe a year. And, um, you know, he was like, thank you so much for telling me that. I really appreciate it. And he had Brandy have, you know, he called Brandy over and made me tell her what the story was and whatever. And uh, she teared up, you know, and it's good to know that you, it don't matter who it is. You could tell someone a story about their family that they don't know. And it makes them feel that way. So if it were to ever happen that Cody were to give me an opportunity, I would feel the same way, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and I would tell people about it the same way. And the same one thing that I hope that Warhorse and Eddie Kingston do, you know, I hope that they explain to people how great the opportunity felt to be given that shot. You know, um, they don't have to do nothing, especially like Eddie was signed with NWA, you know, they don't have to do nothing, but the fans kept asking for it and they gave it to him. And that's so amazing that, you know, whether you like Cody or not, that he would do that to any, for anybody, you know, that's just, that shows what kind of caliber man he is. So if I were to wrestle him, it would be an honor. Um, at the same time, like I said, I'd rather be backstage and you know, help dictate some of the stuff because that's where the real power is. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, for sure. For sure. Um, you know, you, you've had, uh, an amazing career. Um, what would be, uh, if you had to pick one song that represents your career, what would that song be? I know it might be kind of hard, but if you, if you had to pick one, well, what would that song be to represent your career? Uh, instantly, it's Snoop Dogg, Pump Pump, because of the Hit Squad, and because of uh-huh. how notorious me and Moff are for using it, and we've had remixes of it and used it and stuff. Um, I've always been huge on Biggie Hypnotize. Yeah. That's just something that, you know, it, it, I feel it. And then, like, when I'm in heel mode, I like using Jay-Z where I'm from um, because that's just another one that you just feel the mood change. Um, the, the unfortunately, though, like, you also need, like, the proper lighting and the right setup. You know, you can't just – the building can't be bright and, you know, clear. It can be dark and foggy, like, almost gritty and grimy when you come out to it. You know what I mean? Um, 
I've also enjoyed using Dead Wrong by Biggie and Eminem when we were in Japan. Yeah. yeah. When we were in Japan, it's always been like, so whenever it was me and Moff, it was Pump Pump. Whenever it was me, it was Hypnotized. But when it was like me, Moff, and Homicide, it was always Dead Wrong. And uh, I don't even know if people even recognize that. You know what I mean? But that's something that we did consciously. And uh, we always kept it that way. Um, and it, in Japan, it just, the one big show, like it's online, you can see it. I'm rapping the whole song <laughs> and the crowd is popping that I'm rapping the whole song. So like, I was just feeling it, you know what I mean? And uh, that's one of those songs that always gets me. But if I were to use a song that's reflective of me, my attitude, my career, um, it would have to be Patiently Waiting by 50 Cent. Uh, it's just something that is proper for everything, you know, I'm always waiting for my chance. I'm always waiting for my opportunity to shine. And when I get it, I do what I can to make sure that nobody forgets that I had that opportunity. You know, um, there are times where I have so much self doubt that it's like, man, I don't even want to go to this show. I don't even want to get dressed, you know, but once I get there, I'm in my zone, I'm in my environment, I'm in my jungle and I just go nuts. You know, I kill, I attack. And I do what I got to do to make sure that, you know, whatever happens, no one could say that I didn't try my hardest to put on a great show. And I actually, when it comes to it, you know, um, I, I could say this, I, nobody's going to say anything otherwise, but when Beyond did the show with House of Glory in 2016, 2017, whatever year it was, um, they put us on because, you know, we're New York and whatever, and it'd be kind of silly to have a Beyond show in New York without the hit squad, you know? Yeah. But I could definitely tell that they didn't have any faith in us um, for whatever reason. And I won't go into any of the reasons because there's nothing specific, but you, you could feel that they were like, oh, this is just a throwaway match. And it was against a private party. Private party was the new guys. They really didn't have that much time for their belts as a tag team. And, um, you know, they weren't really a huge showcase tag team for House of Glory yet. But, you know, we, I heard about them and Mav heard about them. And we knew that they were good, you know. And uh, we took that opportunity feeling that, you know. And, and for me, it was a little bit extra personal because Brian XL wouldn't book me for House of Glory. He knew me. We were cool. When we were younger, I'd always help him with whatever matches we had. But, you know, he didn't want to take the chance on using me he used everybody but me so we uh have the match and i you know it's safe to say we stole the show with them and i would say that being egotistical i'm just saying looking at the rest of the show you could feel it you know yeah. there's something different about that match we went all out and um after directly after the match you know uh brian came up to me and he was like, man, you know, I thought you were just going to use your ride on the hit squad name. And I didn't know that you were taking it serious like this. I thought you were just clowning and whatever. And I, I owe you an apology. And he apologized like a man, you know, mm -hmm. straight up. He didn't book me after that. I think he booked me one time <laughs> a couple years later, but he apologized. But like when I listened to 50 Cent, patiently waiting, that's what I think of. I think of that Beyond show, Beyond House of Glory show in that I was waiting for my chance. Homicide didn't understand. I was like, I don't know why he's not booking you. It's like, I'm not stupid. I should be on those shows, you know? And um, we go and we have that match. And he didn't even, I don't even think he went up to Moff. He just probably just gave him a fist bump and said, good job. But like, he pulled me to the side and talked to me about it. It's like, I just want to send you an apology, you know, because I slept on you. And like, that song, that's what that's all about. And it fits me and it, I've always felt it, you know? Um, and that's probably the song I would go with. <laughs> that's dope. Yeah, that's that. That's a good one to go with. Mm -hmm. Um, I always like that song, definitely. And that was that was on that, Get Rich or Die Trying, right? Yep. That and whole that one of the best albums ever. Yeah, of course. the The first two albums he dropped, pro albums, commercial albums, yeah. were like his best work. And uh, uh, one of my favorite memories is listening to uh, "Get in My Car" in California and Los Angeles, driving up and mm -hmm. down. You know what I mean? Yep. Right? I drop and all you hear do, 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 do. and me and Joe <laughs> driving. Joe's so <laughs> you know what I mean? 
It's one of my favorite memories, you know? 50 was the man at that time, for sure. Um, he's still the man, just in a different way. I guess we all evolved, right? Yep. Um, yeah. All right, so here we go. I'm going to give you – I want to give you five rappers, right? And uh, I'm going to give you their names, and then I, I want you to give me who you think would be their wrestling equivalent. Okay. If you, you know. So mm-hmm. first one would be uh, Tupac. I mean, that's easy. <laughs> it's a notorious 187 homicide, even though homicide. he's notorious 187 homicide, but he's more of a Tupac uh, type. Um, but you could also go Eddie Kingston um, yeah. for the more popular vote, I guess you would say. But for me, homicide has always been the spiritual Tupac of pro wrestling. Um, just his wild, crazy character. Um, but then he has a soft side. You know, the two pop to give you, you know, um, holler if you hear me or uh, hit him up, but then he could give you Dear Mama right after. And mm-hmm. like, it didn't change anything about him. Like, you didn't say, ah, oh, this guy's soft. Nah, you, you felt him. You always felt him. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, that's why I think there's so many people to this day who think that he's still alive because they want his spirit to still be in the world, his presence, because he was something so different. And I feel that with homicide, you know. Definitely. All right. Uh, Biggie Smalls. Um, so Biggie Smalls is kind of hard because he represents Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. Uh, he represents um, he represents going through the struggle and coming up and using his humor, his wit. You know, he knew he was ugly. He didn't care. <laughs> you know, so like I could apply that towards myself, but I'm not ugly like that. So, um, <laughs> and, and he knows I love him. But if I'm going to say anybody's Biggie, I would have to say the wrestling equivalent to Biggie Smalls is Low Life Louie. Low Life Louie, yeah. Yeah, Low Life Louie, man. He grew up in Brooklyn. He knows what it's like to struggle coming up. He did what he had to do. He hustled. You know, um, he's got his cute little way about him. But at the same time, you know, if he has to get violent, he gets violent. And Biggie did the same thing, you know, in his in his lyrics. You know, um, yeah, I think Low Life Louie is the best Biggie Smalls. You know, <laughs> that's, that's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> um, uh, Jay-Z. Um, see, there I would go probably – I would go low-key. And the reason why I say low-key um, is because – Loki made it to a level where not too many wrestlers have gone. And the same thing could be said for Jay-Z. You know, mm-hmm. Started out in Bed-Stuy, Marcy Projects. Key started out in Brooklyn. Um, he wasn't as ghetto. But coming up when we started wrestling, we were in Jamaica, Brooklyn, Jamaica, Queens. We were in hard parts of New York, East New York, all the time. You know, It wasn't like we had it easy coming up even though we grew up in Bay Ridge or whatever, but when we were wrestling, we were always traveling through those hoods and we always got a taste. And um, Loki definitely, you know, transcended coming up from the ghetto into something big, you know, and um, he's a businessman, you know, he's, he's not a businessman. I'm a business man. You know, yeah. what I'm me, you know yeah. so I'll go with him. All right. That's dope. That's a good pick for that one. Uh, big pun. Big pun is me. <laughs> yeah, big pun. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. Big pun is funny. Big pun is cute. He's uh, he could be serious when he wants to be. He's very hilarious. He could tell a good story. Um, the only thing I can't do is rap like him. I mean, yeah. uh, I'm not. I'll never be a a, a rapper. I, I'm gonna eventually. I was thinking about doing something before this whole COVID thing started. I was gonna go and try to do a couple of hours of stand up. And uh, maybe not stand up, but more storytelling, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I definitely feel like I could definitely, you know, make people laugh and entertain them and bring them through a roller coaster the same way that Punch does. You know, if you listen to his rhymes, he's always taking you through a different story, whether it's something that seems realistic, like him doing a backflip. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, actually, like him dealing drugs and something fake, him doing a backflip, you know. Uh, I always feel like we have the same flow and the same, like, ability to make people laugh and go through a whole wide range of emotions. Nice. All right. And the last one, we just talked about them. 50 cent. 
so I mean, think about 50 Cent. He's the definition of a hustler. He mm -hmm. is someone who, I mean, he said it. He could sell ice to an Eskimo. And um, I think I think of Eddie Kingston, honestly. You know, uh, I know that might not sit well with Eddie because he's home of the brave, Yonkers, blah, blah, blah. You know, <laughs> so you might want to X. But uh, he's 50 Cent. Uh, he's someone that can talk his way into anything. Um, and he's charming. He's very, um, he could be for the ladies or he could be for the guys, you know, meaning he's a thug. Um, and Eddie definitely fits that mold. I mean, look at all the people, look at the outpouring of love for Eddie Kingston. When, before he got the match with Cody, people were talking about, you know, give Eddie a shot. You know, and then after he gets a shot, sign Eddie Kingston. What was that? The number five trend in the world. You know what I mean? Is is Eddie Kingston to me? That's just Eddie, but you know Eddie has this thing. He he, the people feel him, and they've been feeling him. Whether it was in CZW, Chikara, uh, Ring of Honor, wherever it was, they felt him. You know when they brought back LAX into Impact, they felt him, and with Fiddy, they feel him. You know this. He has some of his haters. You know, like Rick Ross will never be friends, but <laughs> you know, um, they definitely felt. Fitty, and I think Eddie Kingston's the closest thing to it right now. Oh, see, that's the that's the. See, you did that easily, man. I thought it was gonna be harder than that. <laughs> oh, but again, also, I'm very hip hop minded. Yeah, and of course. I've had conversations like this with Homicide, where we talk about who would be, you know, Tupac or who would be, you know, whatever. And yeah. uh, honestly, I, I kind of see myself more like, um, more like a Slick Rick. In that, um, Slick Rick tells great stories and you know deep stories, but then at the same time he can talk about hitting a, hitting a chick and like it's one of the funniest songs ever. You know what I mean? And uh, like I feel more of that vibe for myself. But you know, um, anything is anything can happen. Anything is possible, and you know, you could put anybody with anybody if you really twist the the words around you know what i mean so yeah facts yeah of course mm -hmm. um so we we know you uh me and andrew you know you always uh you've given us great advice you always helped us there's tons of guys in the business that you have uh that you have helped and you know given good advice to um for you who is that person to you like you are to us um i'm just being i'm being given the 10% warning on my phone and my charger is way out of reach. Um, <laughs> okay. go, We're uh, wrapping up. We're wrapping up. It's all good. Get home from my phone. My phone was like, come on, B. Um, <laughs> now, um, there's a lot of people in my life, in my career, who have given me good advice, uh, who have talked to me and told me things that I would have never thought of. Um, guys like Mikey Whipwreck, who fresh out of ECW, came to JP, saw how me and Moff were. He gave us a lot of great advice. Uh, Samu, the great Samu from the Head Shrinkers and Afa, uh, his father, um, between the two of them. I mean, they've dropped so many gems on me. It's incredible. Like I couldn't, you know, get make a jewelry store. You know what I mean? Like, um, but then there's guys like Manny Fernandez who I was only around him for a couple of months. Manny was so influential to everything that me, Homicide, he did, and Moth, you know, and he, to this day, he's still like, oh, I'm proud of you guys. You guys are my, you guys are my boys, you know what I mean? Um, it's Homicide, you know, I always take things from Homicide, obviously, you know. Um, Key and, and Moth, you know, with Key, he gave me a little bit more business knowledge. With Moth, he gave me more life knowledge, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's guys like Charlie Haas who gave me wrestling knowledge and, you know, Bandito Jr. gave me wrestling knowledge, MVP. MVP, I, I said it, I was like, you know, if it wasn't for MVP, I, I would have had a hard time being in the backstage in Brooklyn because I was nervous because it's Brooklyn, man. You know, and I grew up in Brooklyn and it's was the Barclay WWE, but MVP was there as I come with me and like he hooked it up for me, you know, and uh, he's somebody that, we, we shoot the breeze with, and then there's my boy Guapo that we talk about life and 
you know, he's somebody that a lot of people don't like, but I've always been, we've always had a great relationship and it don't matter what anybody else thinks, you know what I mean? Um, but then, you know, it, it's simple as my mom. My mom is very outside the box with her thinking and she's always been fair. Whereas some parents are like, you're my star, you're my, my prize, you know, you're my world. My mom cared, but at the same time, my mom was, look, you know, you're not going to get anywhere if you don't get in shape or you're not going to do anything if you don't, you know, save your money or eat right or whatever it is, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, whereas a lot of other parents are like, no, go ahead, baby. It's all right. Eat that. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, has always been fair. If it wasn't for my mom, you know, I was, <clears throat> you know, she had a lot of gay friends coming up and. I would have never have had, I would have never met any gay people coming up, you know, mm -hmm. in the way that like, there's a lot of white people who were like, Oh, I've never met any black people because they weren't around yeah, during yeah. the nineties. It wasn't as prevalent, you know, they had their own little areas, but my mom, she hung out with a lot of gay people and they were always cool. Um, she made it easy to not judge. And, um, you know, that's from my mom. That's her character. And I picked up a lot from her. Um, so, you know, it, it, there's a lot of people um, who have their touches and their sprinkles, you know, on me and my characteristics and stuff. And I'm very grateful for the people I've met and I've had in my life because my circle is very small. I don't like a lot of people. <laughs> I know I'm friendly. I know I'm friendly. You know, I can entertain people. But in reality, I don't like being around a lot of people. I don't like doing a lot of things with people. I just like having the guys I like hanging out with. You know, some days I want to hang out with, you know, Homicide and Key. Some days I want to hang out with Hernandez. Some days I want to hang out with Chris Dickinson, uh, Mike and Angel, LAX, Santana Ortiz. Uh, you know, but do I want to hang out with all of them? Probably not because there's just too much going on. And I, I like keeping things, you know, quiet and reserved, you know. Yeah. But ultimately, you know, I'm happy with guys that are like me, like-minded uh, guys like you and Andrew who appreciate what I tell them and you know you give me stuff and I'm always I love talking to you guys you guys are a lot of fun to talk to for me um, you know guys like Matron the JP film crew mm -hmm. Scott, um, those are my brothers you know uh, Low Life Louie another brother um, you know guys like that that I grew up with and I've known for a long time that I could be comfortable with you know and I just no matter what ultimately I'm grateful for everything that anybody who's ever taken time to invest in either talking to me or watching me or listening to me, I'm grateful because again, I say it every time. I'm a nobody. I'm just a kid from Brooklyn. Probably wasn't supposed to do anything special, but somehow I lucked out and I got real lucky and I got to travel the world and do a lot of cool things and meet a lot of cool people. And I'm, I'm always going to be appreciative of that. You know, that's just something. And it's yeah. from my mom. You know, you appreciate what you get. You get what you get. You don't get upset and you learn to love it. You know what I mean? Yeah, facts, facts. No, definitely. And, um, you know, man, I don't even have to tell you, you know, how important you've been to me and Andrew and, you know, helping our careers in the podcast world. And we've exceeded far beyond what we ever expected that we would exceed to. And, uh, you know, definitely from me and from Andrew, for sure, uh, you know, we both wish you the best. And, um you know, we'll look forward to having those chats with you later on down the road at all these events that, you know, we see you at and all that. And uh, I just want to say, you know. Video game uh, nonsense set up next time. We've done wrestling. We did music this time. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to get, you know, another, uh, maybe another music uh, podcast and then a video game podcast. I got you, man. I got you. <laughs> you trying to make me work, man. <laughs> but, but you know, I, I definitely I appreciate you taking the time out, man, and, you know, coming on to the show. And I felt, you know, you were pivotal in helping, helping us launch Wrestling IQ 101. And I wanted you to be, you know, one of my first guests that helps, you know, blast off this podcast as well. Oh, thank you. you. You know, I'm always proud of you guys and I'm always willing to help and Again, I'm appreciative of you even asking me to be on. And it didn't, not just this show, but the very first time we ever did Wrestling IQ. And, you know, um, I'm just, like I said, I'm grateful to have you guys in my life because you guys are some of my favorite people to talk to, you know. And it's not just for podcasting. It's just life in general. I mean, we, we hold court whenever we see each other in person. 
Yeah. You know I mean? And that's some real nonsense. So uh, I'm very, you guys are some of my favorite people to ever talk to. So definitely, definitely appreciate that. Um, if anyone wants to connect with you, any uh, social media plugs or anything like that you want to drop? Pretty much just on Twitter, Steve Mac DHS. Um, I killed my Facebook. I might bring back a Mon Smack fan page at some point, but uh, it, honestly, social media is getting rough uh, with all the content going on. Too many people are home for way too long and bored out of their minds, and they're ruining yeah. a lot of people. So, you know, uh, it's hard. But yeah, Steve Mac DHS on Twitter is definitely where you can reach me. Awesome. Definitely. Make sure you follow them. Uh, check them out. Uh, you can see all of uh, Monster Mag's great matches that he had. Uh, singles alongside um, uh, Moff with the His Squad. Um, a lot of classic stuff there. Um, make sure you subscribe. Make sure you uh, follow Rap and Wrestle on Twitter, Instagram, iTunes, uh, Spotify, YouTube, all that good stuff. Just type in Rap and Wrestle Podcast and all that good stuff will come up. Um, once again, Mac, thank you. And uh, for this episode, we are out. Peace out.